Welcome to All Voices. I have a special guest with me. He is a senior policy analyst for the West Virginia Center of Budget and Policy. He is Sean O'Leary. Sean, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Ray. Good, good, good. Hey, man, thank you for coming on. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, again, this is your first time here. So again, welcome to Our Voices. Um, as you well know, this is the election season. A lot of things uh, are in play. Uh, but we're not going to talk about politics because, again, I'm going to keep it eco e e economical and policy related. The oh, big topic uh, is um, the premium increase for PEIA. And, of course, you know, when we look, when we look at PEIA, we look at the the effects uh, for the state employees and the teachers, as well as some county officials and employees. Um, but before we go into that, Sean, please tell the viewers something about Sean O'Leary. Um, something cool about Sean O'Leary is I love taking pictures of the the moon and night sky. Um, I've got them all over my office around here. Um, I go out to Calhoun County and uh, take pictures of the Milky Way and the stars and the moon, and that's one of my uh, favorite hobbies. Okay, all right. Well, let's get it started. Uh, Sean, the big issue right now is uh, PEIA is looking to raise in the premiums, uh, which is something that a lot of people didn't really care too much for. Last year, um, the governor, uh, Jim Justice, uh, gave the state employees a pay raise only to turn around and uh, for PEIA to turn around and raise the premium, which basically kind of just break even and now they're looking at again raising it again please share your thoughts on that and please tell the audience uh what is the reason for the premium increase if you if you yeah, can talk i mean yeah this is this is happening after years of inaction um we've not done anything to address the program solvency uh, we know that it's been in a, a big hole um, it's it's had a, a hundred hundreds of millions of dollars of shortfalls. Um, we've used temporary surpluses. We've used one time funding to to close that gap. But you know, we finally with um you know we've run out of that surplus money. So now we're having to actually take action. Um, so now we saw um last year was Senate Bill two sixty eight, which um um saved the state money so to speak. But by doing it by increasing costs on those who are insured by PEIA, by increasing um, enrollment and premium increases for the for four years. So we saw last year's, we're seeing this year's, we're going to see two more um, over the next two years. Um, and that premium surcharge for the dependent spouses who are offered health insurance through their own job. Um, together, those are going to get the PEIA back to a strict 80-20% um, employer premium split where the state pays 80% of the premium and employees, state employees pay 20%. That's, that was the intent of the legislation. Um, in the past, there have been recommendations from the PA board to loosen that 80-20 uh, premium split uh, to make it a minimum 80% instead of a maximum 80%, which would provide more relief for employees. But that's not what we have right now. That's not what Senate Bill 268 did. Um, what it did was it brought us back to that strict 80-20% split and that means that there's going to be premium increases the past two years, and there's probably going to be premium increases the next uh, the, the preceding two years. Um, we're looking at you know 24% increase last year, a 14% increase this year. Um, uh, according to the PEIA projections, another 10% increase next year, another 10% increase in 20, uh, fiscal year 2027. So we're looking at over a 60% uh, cumulative change and premiums for for state employees uh, once all said and done. So when you say sixty percent, sixty percent difference, 
uh, is that in favor of of the employee or or the, the policyholder, or is it, or is this a detriment? Um, it, it's going to be a, a big, big, big cost increase. Um, that that's going to cost you know the the typical state employee or the uh, or the family coverage almost four thousand dollars a year. Um, um, compared to what they were paying in fiscal year 2023. Um, that's going to have a significant impact on cost. That's going to have a significant impact on, on the state's ability to attract employees. And that's going to have a significant impact on um, the quality of health care that, that families are seeing. Sean, you mentioned about the uh, shortfall. And uh, does, I mean, are, are is PEI still seeing a shortfall? Uh, is there like a unfunded liability of some sort? I mean, there's something that PEI is not paying? Um, this, this These premium increases were designed to close that shortfall. So the shortfall was about $376 million. This is going to increase by $500 million. Um, the, the, the premiums coming into the program, both from the state and the employees. So that shortfall should be taken care of by these premium increases for the next three to four years. Okay. So... I know that there have been some uh, uh, changes in the benefits. Uh, some, uh, one thing is some medical supplies uh, that was covered now is no longer covered because they consider it a, uh, an over-the-counter item. Uh, do you know how much they're saving in that department? Um, I don't have a number on that, but benefit cuts are always a cost saving measure, um, but they're short sighted and they're harmful um, that, you know, raising out of pocket costs for deductibles, raising co-pays, um, reducing um, coverage, cutting benefits, you know, taking things that were covered and now saying they're not covered. This all exacerbates um, the problem of PEIA that always, you know, that we, we see this in state agencies that have vacancies. We see this in state agencies that are paying lower than the private sector, that are paying lower than neighboring states. Um, it makes it more difficult to attract qualified employees. And it contradicts what our commitment is to help families address rising costs. Um, the legislators have stated that they want to do that. But this, by doing that, by, by cutting benefits, reducing benefits, that increases costs on working families beyond what the premium increases are. Sean, is privatizing a smart idea? I think that's a very harmful and short-sighted idea that will likely fail to save, save the state much money and fail to save employees much money. Um, nearly every state in the country has a self-insured health coverage for their public employees. Only two states operate privatized systems. Um, and even if we do privatize the system, the state is still going to be on the hook for the employer share of the premiums, meaning that there's going to be little savings um, for the state and there's going to be little savings for the, the employees. Sean, when we look at the cost of insurance, again, as opposed to some uh, when it comes to premiums and everything, I remember there was a uh, there was an article in 2009, a CNN article. This is when Manchin was governor, uh, not to pick on him, that there were people, state employees, that they qualified for welfare. <sighs> Could there be some sort of like a, 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 a temporary relief or, or a fix or uh, some sort of like a, a special tier for employees that make less than the household, the, the median income here in West Virginia? Could there be, can they set something up like that? And would it be cost savings for them? Um, I, I, you know, there's possible that there could be some cost savings that way, but that, that leads down to a dangerous path of where we're paying our employees some of the lowest salaries in the nation. You know, our teachers rank 51st in, uh, among the 50 states in DC. Our um, higher education faculty salaries are 47th. Um, our starting salaries for corrections officers are $10,000 less than the national average. Um, you know, we already pay our employees so little that relying on that fact to find cost savings, um, it leads us down a dangerous path. Um, you know, this, you know, we, that's where you're going to see vacancies. That's where you're going to see trouble hiring teachers. That's where you're going to see hot, trouble hiring CPS workers. That's where you're going to see trouble hiring corrections officers. Um, 
you know, we can't rely on low salaries to to save us from from healthcare costs. Um, we, if anything, we should be investing in these in these uh, salaries, increasing them, and getting us closer to the national average, so that we're able to better attract the uh, you know high quality teachers, that so we're able to better attract you know state employees throughout the state, um, and that make sure that they're able to to make ends meet and and live a a a you know a lifestyle that reflects the amount of work and the education that they have. You say you talk about the cost of living as far as salaries and everything like teacher salary, uh, CPS, you know, things like that. Um, not to get political. What is a solution for state employees uh, like first responders, like teachers? What's the solution as far as a higher, higher pay rate, like a pay raise? What's the, what's the solution for that? I mean, we, need, we we need to do away with this this fetish fetishizing um flat budgets. You know, we've had flat budgets for six years now. We act like we're very proud of the fact that we have flat budgets, but that means we're not investing. We're not investing in our workforce. We're not investing in our teachers. We're not investing in higher education. We're not making any investments anywhere in the state. Um, instead, we've been cutting taxes. Um, and those tax cuts have largely benefited the wealthy. Um, the most recent tax cut that they passed and during the special session amounted to 40 cents per week for the, the typical West Virginian. So the typical state employee would see 40 cents a week um, while their health insurance premiums are going up by thousands of dollars. Um, so we need to get rid of this idea that a flat budget is ideal and start looking at making real investments using instead of um using what uh, revenues we have to, to, to eliminate the income tax by investing those revenues back into the state, back into the people of the state, and back into the people who do some of the most important work in the state. Sean, the, uh, the governor, uh, he has a commercial, has a campaign ad, uh, saying that the, the biggest tax cut in state history. Please tell the Please tell the viewers. Uh, again, like you said, it 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 helps the 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 wealthy. But say, for example, someone who's making let's say forty thousand dollars a year, and we're going to break it down. How much will that employee save? Um, you know, when when we had the initial the initial tax cut and 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 the, and the two after that, you know, we're talking about for a, a middle class family, you know, three to four hundred dollars per year. Um, you know, when we're talking about the wealthiest in the in, in the state, we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars, ten thousand um, dollars, for the wealthiest in the state. So so the the you know the largest tax cut in history of the state was really tilted towards the wealthy. Um, the typical West Virginian is not going to notice it that much. It's going to be um, taken away by inflation. It's going to be taken away by their um, health insurance premium increases. It's going to be taken away by just the regular cost of living that go, that go up every year that, that we all we all know about. Um, increased utilities, increased food costs, um, <clears throat> and increased healthcare costs that we're seeing now. Um, and at the same time, that's starving the state of the necessary necessary resources that it needs to invest, that it needs to invest in making uh, higher education more affordable, that it needs to invest in making teacher pay more um, um, more competitive, with state employee pay more competitive, with bringing costs down for for uh, state employees, for for um, ensuring that we have adequate protections for foster care uh, children, for ensuring we have adequate protections for our corrections officers. Um, all of those things we're not able to do because we are giving away our revenue to the wealthiest in the state. Sean, in 2016, the governor appointed me to the PEI Finance Board, and I saw some of the numbers. Uh, yes, it was a case of kicking the can down the road. And uh, Yes, it was nice and all that the premium stayed where they're at, but I knew at some point in time uh, it was a matter of the can is up against the wall. You can't kick it any further. So it's like it, now it's time to pay the piper. So now this is where we're at. Um, is it is it is it just a, a, a matter of uh, the healthcare industry? It's just it's just 
I hate to say this as a price gouger. It, can can you say that? Is it then our what do you think? Um, you know, I don't have data in front of me that's, you know, that says that the price gouging, you know, how much that contributes to to overall healthcare costs. But we know healthcare costs go up every year and they go up faster than the cost of living. They go up faster than 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 regular inflation. Um so that the fact that we were that we, you know, kicked the can down the road so many times and used these surplus funds, these reserve funds. The 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 uh, you know set aside money for a rainy day and use it for PEIA. Um, the fact that we did that for so many years, exactly right. We, we're hitting the wall now. We're, we've got no more room to kick the can down the road. So that's why we saw a twenty four percent increase last year. That's why we're seeing a fourteen fifteen percent increase this year. We're going to see another ten percent next year and another ten percent after that. Um, and it's the same. The same can be said with other areas of the state budget, uh, particularly Medicaid. You know, we we've we've you know hit the ball with Medicaid, and we've moved money around, and we've and we've relied on enhanced federal matches. We've relied on pandemic funding. We've relied on a lot of different things to keep the Medicaid costs down um, artificially when we should have been investing that whole time in, in making sure that that program was solvent and that program was um, secure. Um, now we're going to be running up against that wall in the next year or two, just like we ran up against the wall with PEIA, where we're going to need significant investment in Medicaid to keep that program solvent to protect healthcare for, you know, 230, 200, 300, 300,000 uh, low income West Virginians who rely on the Medicaid program um, for their health care. Um, and, and, and that's a responsibility of the state that that is an, um, a, a something that the state has to do in federal with partnership with the federal government. Um, and it's yeah, yeah, at the same time, you, you, I keep harping on this point. We're running up against the wall with Medicaid. We're running up against the wall with PIA. And at the same time, we are cutting income taxes and giving big income income tax cuts to the wealthy and relatively small peanuts to the, to the middle class. And you say invest, invest in employees, right? Like teachers. Uh, will the food tax, will that help? Because I, 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 if, if memory served me, uh, then Governor Early Tomlin, uh, he eliminated the food tax. Is that correct? Yeah, we no longer have the sales tax on on groceries, so that that provided some tax relief, and that was a that was a tax cut that that benefited the middle and low income households um, more than it did the high income households. So that you know that was a, a tax we could afford it at the time, um, and it and it it it, it was targeted um, so that it benefited uh, those who needed help the most. Um, the income tax is the exact opposite of that. It is targeted to help those who need the help the least, who have the most. Um, so, you know, the, this income tax cut is not providing the same amount of tax relief to those who need it the most, who are seeing these premium increases, who are making a middle class income, who are struggling with with, you know, the inflation, with in, with utilities, with their own health care costs. Um it's it's not helping them, and it and it, and in fact it's hurting them because that means we have less money to invest in increasing their salaries and keeping their healthcare costs down, and and um you know making sure that the state is an attractive place to work. What other investments can the state look into to generate more revenue, maybe to help offset the cost of the premium increase? Uh, one one person mentioned uh, maybe legalized marijuana. I mean, is that possible? I mean, that's a possibility. I don't think it will bring in as much revenue as as, as some like to think it will. Um, you know, we're we're behind the curve now. It's it's becoming you know those states that were early adopters were the ones who saw big increases in revenue. Um, I, I forget the number that we came up with, but it was, it was in the tens of millions. So some, but not, 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 not nearly enough to, to, uh, to really offset and, and fully fund PEIA. Um, but you know, the biggest thing we can do is reverse these income tax cuts, you know, get rid of the trigger. So there's no more, um, you know, that, that doesn't happen every year. Like it's been happening, um, to, to stop adding on to it. 
and to take a, a hard look at, at, at what it's done to the state budget, take a hard look at who it's benefiting and consider that, you know, we're on the wrong path and we need to be reversing the course, um, reforming our income tax so that it doesn't um, tax the low and middle income households, um, having it so it taxes more high income households, adding additional brackets. Um, bringing back some of the tax cuts that happened under Mansion, including to the corporate income tax and business franchise tax, those have largely failed to deliver on their promise to increase, you know, jobs and increase economic activity. None of those promises came true. Um, so, you know, the tax cut obsession that we have in this state is not working, um, and we're seeing the results of that right now with this PEIA uh, premium increase. So, you mentioned corporate tax, and again, I'm, I'm bringing all this up because, again. Some folks may not understand, and a lot of folks are thinking, okay, what possible way that this can be turned around to make it a positive? Because ultimately, Sean, as you know, the, the, the population here in West Virginia is declining, and we'll look at that probably seven years in a row, it's declining. And we look at, like I said, tax cuts and everything, you know, corporate tax. If I'm wrong, just say, shut up. <laughs> Cor corporate tax. Let's say a, a business wants to come in. You give them a tax cut, say for ten years, okay. Um, but you know, here it is, year ten. You figure, okay, they're the business is doing good and everything, and so here comes year eleven. Now it's time to pay taxes. So what does that company do? They just up and leave. Is that something? that has taken place here, that, that, um, that idea. What we've seen is that we've offered the tax cuts up front and the businesses have not come. The jobs have not increased. Um, we've had some of the lowest job growth in the country, um, despite the fact that we enacted at the time what was called the most pro-growth tax reform in the country. Um, you know, we reduced the corporate net income tax. We eliminated the business franchise tax. We consolidated a bunch of tax credits to make them eat more easy to apply for and to receive for businesses. And it doesn't work because what businesses want is a highly educated workforce. They want um, good infrastructure and they want access to markets and access to materials. Now, we have some of those things. We have, you know, we have raw materials. We have natural resources. Um we can have a highly educated workforce if we make those investments. We're not right now. We don't have it right now. Um, and, and, and that's largely why we don't see economic growth that we've been promised. You know, we don't have a highly educated workforce. We don't make investments in education. We don't make investments in higher education. We cut yeah. taxes thinking that that's going to make the difference. But when 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 you when you line up the cost of doing business, um, of all the things businesses have to pay for, you know, they have to pay for land, they have to pay for their own utilities, they have to pay for the raw resources, they have to pay for marketing, they have to pay for their utilities, they have to pay for their facilities. Taxes are probably the smallest piece of that pie that they actually pay. So we're out there on the margins fiddling with, um, with uh, you know, tax cuts and tax credits and all of these things when, when their actual cost of doing business isn't affected at all. Um, so, you know, what we need to do is make West Virginia an attractive place beyond a being a low cost state um, to make it more attractive to businesses. And that means investment. That means investment in roads, infrastructure, um, workforce, education, um, all of those things that the state the state is responsible for. Um, and the state needs resources to do that. Um, you know, having a, a you know, multi-year double digit premium increase for state employees does not make the state an attractive place to do business because some of those employees, you know, when new people come into the state, that means there's going to have to be new public employees to provide the services for those people. Um, and, and that's just not going to be attractive to the state. Um, those people are going to want to send their kids to the best schools in the, in the country, and they're not going to want to send their kids to schools that pay their teachers 51st in the country. Um, they're not going to want to pay higher education in a state that is cutting higher education every year and seeing tuition costs go up. They're not going to want to send their kids um, to um, a, a state that doesn't provide, you know, quality health care for low income and, 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 you know, working class West Virginians. 
Um, they're not going to want to do that. And, and that's what's all at risk when we don't make those investments and when we instead go after these tax cuts that, again, for the typical West Virginian, don't add up to much. And for the typical business, don't reduce their cost very much. Is small government effective? In, in go the, ahead. I'm sorry. The, the, is, 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 is the smaller government help the cause as far as like, you know, PEIA and, and Medicaid, things like that? Does it help or would bigger government be helpful? Um, the, there's no right size to government. What, what matters is you're getting done what needs to be done. And right now we're not, you know, we're, we're not paying our teachers enough. We're not, we're not providing, um, um, quality benefits to our public employees. We're not, you know, seeing, um, investments in higher education. We're not seeing investments in, in infrastructure that we need to be seeing. Um, we're not making, we're not lowering costs outside of taxes for businesses. So when you, when you cut taxes, you, you eventually shrink government and that will make it less effective. Um, but the, the right sides of government is the one that provides the need, you know, provides for its citizens, that provides the needs and 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 um, goods, public the public good that citizens need to to um, to, thir to flourish and thrive in the state. And that means high quality education. That means top of the line infrastructure. That means world class universities. And that means you know well well. Um, Adequ adequately uh, adequately paid public employees who are providing all of those services. You mentioned earlier about investing in the highly educated. Define highly educated. And is there a threshold to where, uh, is it like, you know, post-secondary education and up uh, or master's degree and up? Or where, where where's the threshold from the highly educated from the not so highly educated? West Virginia has the lowest share of its workforce with at least a bachelor's degree. Um, so and, and that's one of the first things businesses look at when they're looking to relocate somewhere is, you know, how much how much of your population has a college degree in West Virginia? Um, ha, you know, typically we're at the bottom when it comes to that. Um, so, you know, you know, if I were in charge of, of, the, of the state, that's one of the first things I would look at is, you know, how are we investing in higher education? Are we making it more affordable? Are we making it less affordable? Are we getting, you know, high school students opportunities? Or are we taking opportunities away? And, and, and unfortunately, that's what we've been doing. We've been cutting, we've been cutting resources to higher education. We've seen uh, the universities and colleges reduce, um, increase tuition. We've seen scholarship, promise scholarship lose its value. We've seen, um, you know, programs reduced, offered degree de degree programs cut. We've seen um, enrollment declining. We've seen, you know, just our state moving in the wrong direction when it comes mm -hmm. to higher education. Um, and, and again, that's that's one of the first things that we look at when you're a business and you're and you're looking to locate in the state. I I ask a few people uh, random questions, and because I said I'm going to interview you. And um, let me give you a few questions to uh, that someone gave me. One question was, please give your opinion on the so-called $800 million surplus, surplus as it relates to the underfunding of the foster children program and the privatization of public education. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the surplus is right to be called so-called. Um, I could go into a, a really into the weeds of why it's a so-called surplus, but when when you underinvest in the state, when you reven when you estimate that your revenues are going to come in lower than they were the year before, and you don't put money into CPS, you don't put money into foster care, you don't put money into higher education, then you'll see a a surplus. Um, but that surplus exists on paper. It's not a surplus that you know we've paid all our bills, we've met all our needs, we've made all the investments we need to make, and we have this money left over. It's we've cut back, we've we've not invested, we've underestimated our revenues, we've <clears throat> not not you know didn't take care of PIA for several years, and then that creates this illusion 
that we have a surplus. And then we use that illusion of a surplus to argue for things like tax cuts, like privatizing public education. Um, that's one of the most expensive things that we've done in recent years is, is um, you know, the Hope Scholarship voucher, which is, uh, you know, essentially privatizing public education, taking public dollars and, and putting it into private schools. Um, but, you know, we, 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 you know, created this illusion that we could afford to do that because we we had on paper a surplus that only existed because we weren't making investments and we were technically um, underestimating our revenues, knowing that that would generate a surplus um, on paper. Um, another question. When it comes to PEIA, and I, I thought this question was kind of Kind of harsh. Can the employees of PEIA can they save money by living healthier lives? Um, the, the, there's there's. I, I know there's a medical question. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm not. I'm, touchy, I'm, yeah. Not a, I'm not a medical professional. I don't know the the uh, you know the actuarial studies that 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 look at you know health outcomes. And healthcare costs, mm -hmm. um, you know, I would suspect it's on the margins. You could save, you could save some if you're going to the doctor less, if you're you're receiving fewer treatments, if you're receiving fewer prescription medications. Um, that 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 will that will generate some savings, but I don't think that that's going to offset some of the premium increases that we've seen. That's not going to offset what the state's responsibility is going to be. Um, you know, these are just to to maintain current level, not even to maintain current levels of services because current level of services are being reduced. Um, so I can't, you know, give a definitive answer to that. But, um, you know, there there, you know, it logically flows that there are some minor savings from living a healthier lifestyle that that on an individual basis you might be able to see. But when it comes to the big picture, um, you know, healthcare costs or what healthcare costs are, and the cost of PIA is what the cost of PIA is. I have one, two, at least two more questions on here that someone gave to me. Okay. So you mentioned the Hope Scholarship. That's taking funds out of public education and basically going to, it's being privatized. Is that basically the death death blow of public education? Because if and it sounds like if you're doing if you take public funds and put it into private private education, private schools, and I'm sure that teachers will follow the money as well. So where does that leave the uh, students in public schools? Yeah, every every dollar that we spend on the Hope Scholarship, which it's estimated to, you know rise to over a hundred million dollars, two hundred million dollars over the next few years, um, is a dollar that we're not spending on our public schools. Um, and that's a dollar we're not putting towards our teacher pay raises. That's not a, a dollar that we're not putting towards our libraries. It's not a dollar that we're not putting towards our classrooms. Um so you know it it it's it is starving our public school system and and that's resulting in 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 and you know negative outcomes that 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 means um, you know are, we're less attractive to teachers, um, less resources for students, um, and then we're sending the money to schools that don't have you know you know services for students with disabilities that don't have services for students with with um, learning um, learning disabilities that don't have students with special needs. Um, they don't have to provide those things like the public schools do. So it becomes more expensive for the public schools to provide those services while while we're giving money to schools that don't need to provide those services. So those students get left behind. Students in rural areas get left behind because private schools locate in urban areas because they, they're they looking for customers. Um, you know, they, they, students are a customer. The students pay, they pay tuition, they pay a, a price. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, that's how the private sector works in every other industry. And it's no different in education. Um, so, you know, a rural county that doesn't have a Walmart, that doesn't have a grocery store is also not going to have a private school. Um, so there is no choice for that student. The student is, is, is in the public school and the student needs those resources, but that school is still losing those resources as they are diverted to the private school. 
So, you know, you're seeing rural students hurt, you're seeing students with disabilities hurt, you're seeing students with special needs hurt, and you're seeing the overall system just starved of necessary resources. Um, when enrollment declines, the funding formula shows, um, you know, dictates that that fun, uh, funding declines. Um, so as, as we keep diverting money away, um, that's going to do nothing. You know, I, I, I challenge anyone to go into any public school in the state, take a look around and say, yeah, they've got everything they need. Their libraries top of the line. Their teachers are paid like they deserve to be paid. Their classrooms have all their resources. Um, that's not happening in West Virginia. We know that's not happening in West Virginia. So until until we can answer yes to that question, that yes, every school in the state, every public school in the state has all of its needs met, that are, their teachers are adequately paid, that their their resources are all are all um top of the line, you know, the the envy of the rest of the nation. Then, so when, then why on earth would we take money away from them? So when you look at privatizing education, that's when the school has the they have the final say so whether that child is accepted into the school or not. They could they could turn that child away if they want to, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, public schools are universal. Um, it's in the state constitution. The state has to provide public education for every student in the state. That's not the case for these private schools. They can turn students away for any reason. They can turn them away for their, uh, you know, special needs status. They can turn them away for their sexual orientation. They can turn them away for their religious beliefs. Um, there, there's nothing that that says that these private schools that we're giving public money to have to provide a, a universal education like we do with public schools. But Sean, you just said that in the Constitution that they have to put money into public education, right? It yeah. Does not say, it, but it does not say a certain amount, right? But as, as long no. as they cut, as long as they're making cuts to 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 filter to private education. As long as some money is there, they're meeting, they're they're meeting uh, the the words of the Constitution. They're funding public education. Didn't say how yeah. much, or, or yeah. a, a, a floor or minimum amount, but they're funding it, right? There, there's a there's a formula that was set by the Supreme Court that determines you know the minimum level of funding for public education the state is responsible for. Um, it's largely based on enrollment. So when enrollment declines, there's less money available. But we know that that you know just because enrollment declines doesn't mean all of those needs go away. It doesn't mean that it's any any less expensive to provide uh, public education to a classroom of twenty than it is to a classroom of twenty five. In fact, we would prefer to see smaller classrooms, um, and but not through you know declining enrollment, but through more investment in more schools and 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 more resources. Um, it becomes more cost effective that way. But, you know, there is nothing in the Constitution that says that private schools have to offer those safe services, that private schools have to meet certain standards, that private schools have to accept all students. Um, but that's that is that is the uh, the responsibility of the public school system and the responsibility of the state and the responsibility that we should be investing and in, and in, in making sure that our public schools are are the best we can possibly make them. Is there any cost effectiveness when it comes to consolidating schools? Um, it becomes cheaper, but at the end of the day, is that it's cheaper better? Um, you know, you want each school to have the resources necessary. You want each school to be effectively educating each child. And when you consolidate schools, you you bring them in. There are, are cost savings, but are those cost savings cost effective? Um, are are they are they you know? channeling resources to the students who need them the most are they you know just or are they just enlarging classrooms and having one teacher teach more students um so so i question whether consolidation is cost effective it may result in cost savings but i think that's different different definition than what i would describe as cost effective okay here's another question from your perspective, do you see that the intent of the administration and legislature to right-size government mean privatizing public services and or purging of civil service appointments in favor of partisan, appoint partisan appointments in the civil service positions? I mean, that that's largely what happens when 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 you have an administration that's that that you know 
again, fetishizes low budgets, that wants to right size government. Um, you know, where where are we talking about this? The, the the biggest the biggest expenditure in the state is for public education. After that, it's Medicaid. After that, you know, there's not much else left. Um, so you know, you can't privatize Medicaid. It's a state federal public partnership. You can try to privatize as much education as you can, and you can try to privatize the rest of state government um, and, and, and wipe out civil service uh, uh, employees. Um, but again, it, it, again, I, it, it's the same with the school consolidation. Is cost savings cost effective? And I, I don't think that's the correct answer. I don't think they are the same thing. I don't think running a cheaper government is a more effective government. Um, I think a government that has its necessary resources will will have better outcomes for the state itself, for the people of the state, for its students, for its employees, um, all of those things. And I, I don't think that eliminating civil service employees, privatizing state agencies, um, you know, you you you'll you'll shrink the budget, you'll 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 you know need less tax revenue. You'll you'll maybe if if privatizing actually produces cost savings, which that's a big question mark in and of itself. I'm kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt by saying that, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, but again, cheaper doesn't mean more cost effective. Just a few more questions, and we'll get you out of here. Sean, how can what 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 is the best solution, the best turnaround solution for the greater good? Because again, we have five states surrounding us. And as mentioned earlier, what about maybe legalizing marijuana? Well, the five states five surrounding states have some sort of legalization when it comes to marijuana, whether it's medical or whether it's recreational. So we're behind eight, well, we're, we're behind the times. What other way that you can turn this economy around and be just as effective as Pennsylvania or Ohio or Kentucky or Maryland? What what other natural resources that, that we can use and what will be the time frame to say, okay, now we have caught up with our neighboring states? Um, it, it's not a short time frame. That that that's what's unfortunate that people don't seem to understand that you can't just turn a state around in a year or two or an under one administration and 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 see see the type of growth that these investments make. You know, we're talking long term investments in our children, and that's what will will turn the state around and start seeing growth, um, start seeing um, us catch up to our neighboring states. Um, it's not going to be tax cuts. It's not going to be cutting to the budget. It's not going to be right-sizing government. It's going to be investing in our children. That 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 is the most bang for your buck. Um, that's the most cost-effective thing you can do. Um, high-quality early childhood education, high-quality public schools, high-quality higher education. Um, and all of those take investment. All of those need revenue. All of those need us not to obsess ourselves with tax cuts. All of those need... <clears throat> us to look at our tax system and see where we can find efficiencies, see where we can find additional revenue and, and invest, invest, invest in our children. At one point, there was 55% um, of the state revenues went towards education. Has that number changed? That's about right. It, it, it's in that neighborhood. It's about, it's about 50%, you know, in the 40 to 40 to 50%. Okay. Sean, I'm going to get you out of here with this. You hold the purse strings. Let's, I'm going to say, I'm going to give you, this is your bag right here, $1 billion. How would you divvy it up? How would you make it work for you? And what would be the return on investment? And you can... I mean, you could put, you know, put a little bit in here and this coffer here and that coffer there. How would you look, how would you perceive it as the return on investment to turn it around? How would you work it? I think I would start with teacher pay. That's what jumps out at me. Um, you know, we're 51st in the country. Um, that That's not acceptable. 
you know, for a state with educational outcomes, with high poverty, with, with, um, with, with, you know, educational outcomes that aren't where we want them to be, it, we can't continue to, to shortchange our teachers the way we do. Um, taking a look at our tax system, I would enact a child tax credit that's fully refundable, um, giving people money back. At the end of the day, low and middle income households, giving them money back um, for their children. Um, that 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 is, you know, a wealth of research has shown that 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 has positive outcomes throughout the child's life into adulthood. Um, I would you know, I've written an an analysis of, you know, just how inexpensive it actually would be to make college tuition free in the state. Um, It would cost way less than our tax cuts that we've 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 paid for. Um, these past few years. Um, so making higher education tuition free for in-state students, that's going to bring people into the state. Um, putting money into those higher education institutions so they're still providing a top line, the best in the country, um, public education, higher education system in the, in the country. Um, I would protect Medicaid. I would protect PEIA. And, you know, you do those five, six things. And I, I, I think you would really see a, uh, a change in the state, the perception of the state, a change in our trajectory and a change in our outcomes. He is Sean O'Leary, the senior policy analyst for the West, West Virginia Center of Budget and Policy. Sean, thank you very much. You take care. Okay. Thanks, Ray. Thanks for having me. Oh, for a second.